All right, so we're going to get started now. Uh, welcome, everyone. I uh, hope everyone's doing well and staying safe. Uh, this is our Health Talk webinar series brought to you by the College of Health Solutions here at ASU. Um, College of Health Solutions addresses challenges facing people and communities to stay healthy, improve their health, and manage chronic disease. Uh, the Health Talk series is just one way that we serve the community uh, continuing with continuing an interprofessional education at no cost, of course. Uh, today, our topic is on COVID-19, obviously very timely from bench to bedside, the role of clinical testing, uh, as well as public health testing in, uh, for surveillance. Uh, very timely, especially today when we saw, at least reported through the AZ Central um, newspaper that they have about 1,700 new cases today. Granted, some of those are from uh, backlogged, I think, from the antigen, antigen test that they've uh, added to the totals, but still represent sort of an increase from the downward, some of the downward trends that we've seen um, over the last few weeks. Um, so in any event, we're going to talk a little bit about that. But uh, so I'm Matthew Scotch, your moderator, and I guess I'm uniquely positioned to moderate this given my, my role both in CHS as an associate professor of biomedical informatics, and then in biodesign, I'm assistant director of the Biodesign Center for Environmental Health Engineering, where I do molecular and genomic epidemiology of RNA viruses, mostly flu, but like a lot of labs uh, switch on the fly to to SARS these days. Um, and we're gonna hear today though, you'd rather hear today from uh, our excellent panelists. I don't know how they have time to, to do anything in, uh, other than what they're doing uh, in terms of their busy schedules. Um, but we have uh, Dr. Josh LeBaire, who's the Executive Director of Biodesign Institute, as well as the Center Director for the uh, Virginia G. Piper uh, Center for Personalized Diagnostics. His research focuses on biomarkers and the role they play in early warning for risk of major diseases like cancer and diabetes. He's obviously well uh, traveled in terms of his studies, his medical degree and PhD from UC San Francisco. And of course, you probably know a lot about him through uh, the, the amazing effort that he's gonna talk about today with leading ASU saliva-based testing uh, in the community, uh, as well as statewide. So we're gonna hear from uh, Dr. LeBaire for about 20 minutes, and then we're gonna hand it over to our next um, speaker, David Sklar, who is uh, busy treating uh, in the front lines here, treating patients as an emergency uh, physician. He's also, we're lucky to have him in CHS as a professor of healthcare delivery, as well as senior advisor to the provost. Um, Dr. Sklar got his MD from Stanford University and is obviously well-versed to talk about diagnostic testing in terms of COVID. So we have sort of the clinical perspective here for testing as well as the surveillance and public health relationship. So um, important to touch all angles, of course, as we go through this global pandemic. Um, so enough chatting on my end. I wanna uh, give it over to Dr. LeBaire first. And then of course, at the end, after both Speakers present, we'll have time for Q&A for about, oh, 10, 15 minutes or so, depending on how things go. Um, and I think you can also leave things in the chat box as well as, as they come up. So uh, without further ado, uh, Josh, if you wanna take the reins here. Uh, you're on mute. Yeah. Okay, am I unmuted now? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. All right, just making sure that that's working. Yeah, so it's a pleasure to see everybody. Hopefully my screens are showing. Uh, great, yeah, I will try. To, I'm not gonna go too long on this. Um, I, I wanna make sure there's plenty of time for questions and discussion. So um, uh, hopefully uh, this won't take very long. So um, I don't need to tell any of you um, uh, the, the massive impact that COVID-19 has had on all of us. Um, we are living it day to day. Uh, over six and a half million cases in the U.S. Probably uh, any day now, it will cross 200,000 deaths in the country, 5,000 deaths in Arizona. In both the, the state and the country, it is now the number three leading cause of death 
Uh, it is ahead of accidents, respiratory disease, stroke, Alzheimer's disease, diabetes, pneumonia, you name it. Um, with the exception of all cancers and heart disease, uh, it is the leading cause of death in our country. So it is, it is huge uh, and has had a huge, obviously, uh, economic impact. Um, it, it, uh, as you, many of you know, you know, this disease is caused by a type of virus called coronaviruses, which have been around and known about for a long time, since the 60s. Um, this is a type of virus that infects all kinds of animals. All the animals shown here are infected by this. Um, and uh, in some cases, they represent reservoirs of the virus that come back to people. And in, in the bottom right here, you see a picture of, of bats and, and pay attention to that because that's probably where this came from. If you compare the sequence of this virus to other coronaviruses and look at kind of what family it lands in, um, I don't know if you can see my, I'm gonna switch this to, um, yeah, so if you look down here, here's SARS-CoV-2, um, very closely related to the first version of SARS, hence the, the reason the names are similar. And you can see that in this family, the word bat appears regularly, and that's uh, because it, it's very similar to a lot of other uh, coronaviruses found in bats. And there are evidently elements of the, the bat immune system that make them particularly susceptible to coronaviruses. Um, other known human coronaviruses are, are listed by their names, either in black or red. Black indicates a, a, a human coronavirus that does not cause a lethal disease. And so four of them are like that. And then three of them, um, the Middle Eastern one, uh, the original SARS, and then this one are all ones that cause lethal disease. Um, here's a little bit of a timeline on human coronaviruses and how they relate to people. Um, these two over here were first found in the, in the mid-1960s, uh, and there have been a number of researchers, including our own Brenda Hogue, who work on coronaviruses um, and have worked on them for years. In 2002 was when we first encountered SARS, the first SARS virus, also a lethal virus, very similar to this one. Probably one of the biggest differences is that, um, and you'll hear about this in a moment, that mo most of the time it's possible because of symptoms to tell when these people are infectious. And because of that, um, it's relatively easy to get them isolated. And that's a big difference in, in, you know, uh, with this virus. Um, and then these two guys here and so on. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here. So I always say that this virus, one, the, the virulent virus trifecta, because it has three characteristics that make it primary, such a devastating virus uh, for humankind. Um, severity, spread, and stealthiness. Those are the three characteristics. Severity because even though in many people this virus has uh, a relatively mild course, in, in, a, in a number of people it is not mild at all. It is quite deadly, probably 10 times more deadly than the flu. So this is a pretty severe illness when, it, when it, it, it causes illness. And we are only just now beginning to understand all of the aspects of why this virus is so deadly. I think a lot of us think of it as a respiratory virus, but it has severe cardiac implications. And, and that's one of the reasons that it is so devastating. Spread because this virus transmits in one of the most uh, 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 contagious uh, media, air. Uh, we all have to breathe and so we can't escape air. And um, this thing, uh, it travels by droplets. And then stealthiness, and as I mentioned this earlier, we know now that this virus transmits from, from asymptomatic individuals. And even in people who are destined to get symptoms, the virus is spreading before they get their symptoms. So people are, in, are potentially contagious 24 hours before they realize that, that they even have the virus. And so um, uh, that's what separates this from some of the, from SARS, for example, where um, it was easier to identify people who were infectious. Here, we can't always do that. Uh, there are people walking around all the time who are spreading this virus and don't know that they're spreading the virus. So um, lots of potential clinical complications here. I, don't, I won't walk through all of them. Uh, I'm just listing a number of them, including the respiratory piece, the failure piece. I already mentioned the heart complications. Blood clots are a big issue. Um, down here at the bottom, we're now just beginning to understand people who even people who did not go to the hospital, um, many of them may have continued symptomology even after their infections. There's this thing called brain fog. People get heart arrhythmias and hypertension, fatigue, headaches, and I'm sure um, Dave will probably talk a little bit about some of this stuff as well. Um, I, I, highlighting the fact that this virus spreads in air, um, we know a lot more about droplet spread than we did. When, 
the whole six foot spacing that everybody keeps talking about, the idea of kind of social distancing is based on research in the 1930s. It's very old data. Back before we could even measure small, small droplets. The smallest droplet back then that they could measure were 100 micron you know, uh, droplets. We now realize that um, this virus spreads in droplets of five micron sizes. You know, large droplets, as shown in this slide here by the kind of red color, fall to earth in, in a space of five, you know, anywhere between three and six feet because of gravity. But the small droplets, all these guys in gray here, they linger in the air sometimes for hours. Uh, and so this is the notion that you could walk into an elevator uh, in which somebody had previously been breathing with COVID and possibly breathe that air. That is all certainly possible. So the spacing helps us, but it is far from perfect. Uh, this is where mask wearing becomes so valuable to us. This virus travels by speech. When we talk, we produce 2,600 droplets of moisture per second. So just think about that for a moment. 2,600 droplets per second during normal speech. This is not yelling speech. This is not singing speech, just normal speech. When we talk, we are surrounded by a cloud of our own moisture. And if we're in a room talking with somebody else and we're not far apart, and we're not wearing masks, we're each breathing each other's moisture in that conversation. So that is why this virus is spreading so quickly in our, in our community. Two kinds of tests. Again, I know this is a pretty savvy crowd, so I won't spend a lot of time on this. Um, one type of test is called the qPCR test. This is a molecular test that tests for the presence of the RNA of the virus. And the goal of this test is to look for people who are currently infected, people who are actively producing virus, people who could be spreading it. The other type of test is an antibody test. And this is really looking at um, past exposure. You don't typically produce antibodies to this virus until two weeks after you know, getting it, uh, and maybe even longer. So the antibody test doesn't really inform you about who is actively spreading virus. It's better for kind of tracking who might have had it in the, in the past. And I'm not going to go through all these other, other applications here, but just that's the general notion of these two tests. And of course, um, early on, um, uh, uh, Matthew mentioned the antigen test, which is a little bit similar to the virus test in that it looks for current infection. So keep in mind, the antigen test is not as accurate as the, the viral test is. So uh, our group, um, obviously, uh, early on in this, um, uh, in conversations I had with President Crow, realized that we needed to have testing available for our university. At that time, there was very few tests done in the state of Arizona. I can tell you that when, I did a, when we did a poll of hospitals, there were probably a couple hundred nasal pharyngeal swabs in the entire state at that time in, in, in late February, early March. So the capacity for testing was limited to a few hundred tests available for the whole state. So we got very actively engaged in doing it. We realized as a university, we were uniquely capable of, being, of, of setting up this sort of operation because we had the skill sets, we had the technology. Um, my lab had already been doing qPCR testing for another purpose. We had a lot of robots in place and, and I realized, you know what, we, we know how to do this, let's do it. So, um, we got a group of people. In those days, it was about seven people on a phone call. And we said, how can we get this going and how fast can we get this going? Um, and we started meeting every day, seven days a week, to race against time to get this set up. Um, that phone call very quickly blossomed in a matter of a few weeks from seven people to 70 people uh, who, meet every, who met every day to kind of figure out how to get this thing going. Um, you know, we had experts uh, ranging from folks interested in how do we collect samples, folks interested in how do we get supplies we need to get this going, automation experts, molecular experts, people who um, could think about lab procedures, regulatory experts who could help us get through the CLIA and the FDA, um, and, uh, and database specialists, because you can't do any of this if you can't track the data in a, in a database, and if you can't figure out a way to, while still maintaining privacy of results, get these results back to everybody who needed the results. So, there were like many dimensions that had to be thought of and we were working on all of them at the same time. So um, we, we gave our, we started doing our first testing in, in, in the beginning of April, um, where we actually provided testing to partners. Now keep in mind that ASU doesn't have, a, we don't have no medical school, so we don't have any hospitals that we manage. So we didn't have pa patients providing sample to us from the clinic. So instead we reached out to partners and this turned out to be extraordinarily valuable 
we reached out to partners who needed to do testing because they were critical employers. For example, the power companies that needed to make sure that Arizona had power over the summer. Um, but those guys had to work in tiny rooms, control rooms where they couldn't maintain social distancing. And if one member of that team got sick, they could bring down a whole team and, and, and um, uh, there are only a, a couple dozen of these people in the entire power company. So they were crucial uh, uh, individuals. Or, you know, critical workers at local hospitals that needed support and there was no testing available in their hospitals. So we started providing tests to those critical folks. Since then, of course, we've expanded dramatically. We're now running roughly 4,000 samples a day. So um, dramatically higher than we were before. And we partnered with the state of Arizona and we're providing testing for the public. And so not only are we doing it with our partners, but we open up uh, the door to, to a lot of people to get uh, their tests available. This is kind of an overview of the process. As I mentioned, it's really uh, a multidisciplinary kind of multidimensional project. Um, you need to be able to schedule people for appointments. One of the things that we're quite proud of is none of the people we test has ever waited in line. Um, our, our testing facilities, everything from the drive-through testing at the, at the NFL stadium to testing here at the university, people come at their appointed time and most of them get in and done in a matter of 15 minutes or so. And that was true even when we were testing 500 people an hour at, at the NFL stadium. Uh, and by, that's all because we do scheduling and they do that online using their cell phones or their computers. When they come to get tested, we collect the data at the event. That it means scanning a barcode on the specimen tube and then scanning a barcode on their phone. When they schedule in advance by um, the online schedule, it generates a barcode on their phone and they just flash their phone at us and we can scan that. And of course, if they wanna print it on paper, they can do that too, but most people just do it from their phone. Um, we have a very automated process in the lab. That's what allows us to run thousands of samples every day. That automation is expanding this week. Um, some of you who sit on our call every day know that we are installing, we're very proud of our new capper decapper. One of the limiting things, believe it or not, for our process has been having to have a handful of individuals who spend their entire day just uncapping and recapping tubes. Um, obviously, we don't want to do that. And so we've got a device that now will do that. It can it can uncap 24 tubes in 30 seconds. So think about that for a moment. Um, we run the process on, on, uh, on robots that do all the liquid handling. The results are analyzed automatically and then automatically uploaded by database into our, into our tracking database. And then we have a medical director that reviews all the results, even the thousands of results, and then sends out result. We send out a text or an email to all the participants where they can log in and privately get their own results online. Um, a, a huge change for us was switching over from nasopharyngeal swabs to saliva. Uh, we, were, we were the first site, uh, first group in the country to open up public testing using saliva. We realized early on that, that collecting samples by nasopharyngeal swab was going to be too problematic. You know, a, a, a typical lane in a, in a drive through operation could do about 25 people in an hour. And, um, you know, we have 100,000 people at ASU. There was no way that was going to be sustainable. So we, we thought about it hard and, and early on pivoted to saliva testing where we can collect 500 people in an hour. Um, and that's largely because people can all be collecting their saliva samples separately and in parallel to each other. Um, you don't need a single point of action, namely the, the nurse or the medical care personnel to take a sample from each person you just hand people a straw and a tube and in the privacy of their car or sitting quietly in a chair, they can collect their specimens and then they just have to run up and have it you know, scanned in um, uh, and handed in. Uh, and so it means less PPE usage, it means less medical care usage, uh, medical care personnel to, to run the operation. Um, and um, we don't have to get these scarce swab kits, which are very hard to reach. All we had to do was get straws and tubes and, and those are relatively easy to get. Um, th this is sort of a, an image of the drive-through testing that we run. You can see down here, this card tells people how to collect their sample. One side's in Spanish, one side's in English. Um, here you see a stack of straws in her pocket and um, uh, the, the, there's a tube with a barcode on it. Um, and and our, we, we have all kinds of volunteers who go out and hand these out to people in their cars and then the people kind of drive through this um, serpentine path while spitting into their straw. And by the time they get to the end of that path, they're done and they hand in the sample and they're off. 
Uh, and as I said, um, the reports we're getting from everybody who does it is that the whole process takes 10 to 15 minutes from arrival until they're driving away already. Um, we, we offer testing all over the state. Uh, with our partnership with the state of Arizona, we provide uh, free testing to the public. And a key piece of this was to make sure that we could reach underserved populations. We're very committed to making sure that we can reach out and getting folks who can't otherwise get testing. And so if you look at where a lot of our sites are here, along the borders of the state, um, in up, up in the Grand Canyon area, we've done some testing in um, uh, a number of the uh, uh, Native American communities and, and um, their nation sites. Uh, we're, we're trying to get reach out to folks. We set up these sites and then we collect samples. And of course, we get our answers back in, in usually 26 to 28 hours is the typical turnaround. We very rarely go more than 48 hours and those have been rare exceptions due to you know, communication issues. But most of the time the answers um, get back in under 24 hours. Um, whenever I've done it, I've had it uh, in anywhere between 12 and 18 hours. Um, you know, the ASU community has been thinking about an end-to-end -end solution. So a lot of folks attached to our program have been interested in, in, in contact tracing. Um, this is the process by which when you find a positive, you talk to them, you find out who they've been in touch with, and you reach out to those people and get them tested so that you can limit the spread in the community. That's a key piece of what we're doing. And um, uh, we've got, uh, uh, Megan Jen has trained a whole bunch of these folks who are helping with Maricopa County and um, keeping up with the caseload for, this, for the county so that we can trace everybody who needs to be traced. Um, this is what the results look like on the machine. I won't spend a lot of time on this. Basically, we're amplifying three genes from the virus. So they're in blue, red, and green. If, the, if those cross this, this threshold line, that means that that person has it. The yellow is just a control gene that's present even in the negative cases. So by testing three genes, we're quite sure that if we get a positive, it's a true positive. And our limit of detection is around 200 viruses per sample. Keep in mind that most positive people make thousands of viruses per sample. So we're well, we're well below that region. We also have a website that tracks uh, the data, uh, epidemiological data for the state. Um, we launched this a number of months ago and it is very popular. We've had almost 400,000 page views there, over a billion Google impressions based on our, our, our website. A lot of people regard our site as probably one of the most reliable sites for providing data about the, the pandemic in the state of Arizona and we're, we're quite proud of that. Um, and these are some of the folks in the lab who do all the testing. Um, this is Val Harris, uh, she runs the team She's phenomenal. She's really kind of organized the whole group. And that's all I have. I, I don't want to spend any more time here. I'll hand it over to David and then we can do questions at the end. So I'm going to quit and stop sharing here. That was awesome, Josh. Thank you for that. Um, and again, uh, we'll have questions uh, at the end. Um, but for now, I want to get into uh, Dr. David Sklar's lecture. Dave, do you want to uh, take the reins or do you want uh, to uh, have Zach advance it for you? I think I'll let Zach do it. All right, Zach, you're on, you're on call there. So right. Dave, take it away. So yeah, so I'm gonna start, um, and I'm gonna give you the clinician's perspective because this disease, as well as being very complex and new and interesting, has a variety of clinical implications. And I'm, I work in the emergency department. I've actually taken care of some patients with COVID. And I wanted to share this because I know many of you who are on this uh, webinar probably have questions or concerns about yourself, your family, people you know. And um, unfortunately, the clinical information is just um, getting um, uh, almost overwhelming in terms of keeping up with it. But, I, but I'll try to make some sense of it. So uh, next slide. So uh, the, I guess probably the biggest problem with this disease is that none of us who are in the clinical arena have ever been trained to take care of it. And so we're basically trying to learn about a whole new disease without understanding very much about uh, its various manifestations or what kind of therapies will work, uh, which ones won't work, um, and who's gonna get worse, who isn't. Uh, and all of this, of course, leads to anxiety in the team, all of us who take care of it. And uh, unfortunately, there's been misinformation and lack of leadership because as I think all of us know, um, 
this is both a clinical and a public health disaster. Leadership is very important and, and unfortunately, uh, the leadership uh, at times has been lacking. So uh, next slide. So this is just a typical case. Uh, this is a patient that we see actually fairly frequently, 75 year old man coming from a nursing home. We unfortunately do see a lot of patients uh, who are elderly, who are in various kinds of uh, extended uh, care environments and uh, they get transferred to us uh, this particular individual uh, came in with a fever, chills, shortness of breath. And um, so you can see also uh, that uh, he has some other manifestations that are evident on his chest x-ray and a CT scan. The CT scan actually has characteristic findings that uh, have been used to actually help us make that diagnosis. And those findings um, are different from other kinds of pulmonary diseases like various pneumonias or pulmonary emboli. Uh, and so that has actually been somewhat helpful in terms of being able to sort out when people come in with the symptoms of shortness of breath and fever, which could be many things, uh, which ones have COVID and which ones have something else. Uh, so uh, next slide. And I mentioned that uh, part of the problem here is that we're dealing with a new disease. We haven't been trained for it. And the problem here is that the range of symptoms is quite great and quite variable. And the level of severity, I think as Josh has mentioned, is also very variable. Most people probably are, have very minor uh, types of uh, uh, symptoms or even are asymptomatic. And then uh, there's a smaller group who have serious symptoms. Another unique feature of this disease is that the oxygen content uh, in the blood that we get from uh, the exchange in the lungs can, can drop very low without there being severe symptoms. Most people, as your oxygen content gets lower, you start having difficulty uh, breathing and breathe faster and you're in great distress. And, and so as a clinician, we, we see those symptoms and we uh, understand the person is severely affected. That's not true with COVID. There are some people who are really severely affected, uh, but you don't really have the manifestations that go along with that, sometimes until the, the very uh, end point where they're close to collapsing. Um, and uh, I think some of these other issues Josh has, has mentioned, so I'm gonna skip through them. Uh, next slide. These are just typical symptoms, which uh, we say typical, most people will have fever, cough, but there's a lot of other people who won't have any of those things, who will just have uh, uh, problems with the taste or smell or even have really no symptom, maybe a little bit of achiness. Um, and next slide. Uh, the uh, duration and the progression of the disease is also uh, variable. And many people who have really severe disease, that won't occur until around 10 days out from the beginning of the disease. There are several aspects about that that are important. One of them is that as we diagnose, we may diagnose the disease early on, but we have to monitor people to figure out who's gonna actually get worse and may need to come back into the hospital and who's gonna actually uh, get better. And so that's where we need the oxygen saturation monitors that unfortunately have been in low supply. There are a lot of people actually who can be managed at home with oxygen and the O2 sat monitor if we had enough of that, but there hasn't been enough. So sometimes we have to admit people uh, just because we're not sure who's gonna progress and who isn't. Uh, next slide. And I think I mentioned that most people have relatively minor disease. This is good in some ways, but it's also bad in that we don't always know who actually has the disease because they don't have severe symptoms. So they can spread it around before we even know that they have it. There's about 5% that end up with really critical disease, end up in the ICU, may end up on ventilators. And then about 3% of people will actually die. So that obviously is why we have uh, close to 200,000 deaths. Although not everybody will get the really severe manifestations, there's enough people who will that, uh, that we're getting a lot of people who are dying of the disease. Next a slide. And I mentioned the symptoms and um, these are the, the typical symptoms and I think we've sort of gone over these, so I'm gonna skip to the next slide. Uh, and this is important, this is uh, the, the Cochrane Review, they, they look at all, all kinds of published articles and then try to bring together the best evidence. And 
What's important here is the uh, second bullet, which is essentially that uh, based upon our current evidence, uh, neither the absence nor presence of signs or symptoms are accurate enough to rule in or rule out the disease. In other words, for many diseases like appendicitis, I can pretty much make that diagnosis based on what a patient will tell me and then feeling their abdomen. And I can say, all right, 90% sure this person has appendicitis. And before we had CAT scans, surgeons would take patients to the operating room just based on their symptoms and the physical exam. Well, that's not true with COVID, unfortunately. We can't make a diagnosis just based on the symptoms that people have or even um, what we find on physical exam. And that's why the testing that Josh and others are doing uh, are so critical because we have to really be able to confirm that the signs and symptoms actually are manifestations of COVID and not some other thing like influenza or pneumonia or pulmonary emboli or other things that can look like uh, can, can look very much like COVID. Uh, next slide. And there are three stages uh, worth knowing about. And the first stage is the most common. Some people will just go through that first stage where, where you get the viral uh, response and uh, there's usually a drop in the lymphocytes. Uh, and that's something we can measure with the blood test. And then the second phase is where the chest X-ray and the CT scan will uh, become abnormal and often quite characteristic of COVID. And then the third phase, hopefully not too many people get to that, but about 5% where you have a hyperinflammatory response, elevated uh, inflammatory markers, and even uh, cardiac uh, markers will go up uh, if we have cardiac manifestations. And I do also want to mention there are the common symptoms, the uncommon symptoms, and then there are the complications. So complications are different from symptoms and uncommon symptoms. Complications are things that happen not to everybody, but they're sort of manifestations such as the cardiac manifestations or the neurological. They can happen later on after people recover from other parts of it. And it's important to know that. And then there's the complications like blood clots that can lead to death or other pulmonary emboli, things like that. Uh, and then some people actually develop bacterial infections on top of the viral infection. So I've actually seen some patients in the emergency department who recovered from COVID, we thought, but then developed a bacterial pneumonia later on that was a complication. And we actually see that a lot in influenza where people will recover from influenza and then get bacterial infection and they die from the bacterial infection. Um, okay, next slide. Uh, keeping up with the emerging information, this has really been very difficult because we really um, aren't trained to be able to deal with a flood of information like what we're getting. And so unfortunately, what we get to think is true one day turns out to be not true a few days later. And we are constantly changing our algorithms in the emergency department and in the hospital to try to um, deal with all the new information uh, about what might work and what uh, doesn't work. And I'll go over some of that in a minute. Next slide. And so in the clinical um, environment, our priorities are first of all, stabilizing when someone shows up and they're in uh, some distress, we will usually give them oxygen. And in some cases we may have to intubate them and put them on a ventilator. That's what we call stabilization. And then at the same time, we have to make the diagnosis. Is this COVID? Is this something else? And that's where the chest X-ray, the CT scan will come in. Um, and also that's where we have to do uh, the COVID testing. Unfortunately, in many of our hospitals, we haven't had access to testing uh, th that we really need. And so at times we actually have to send people out who look like they have COVID, but we just don't have enough access to testing to be able to confirm that. But if they're not too sick, we may say try to go uh, to ASU and get your test because again, the hospital is just limited to the amount of uh, tests that we have available. And then we have to make a decision. Even if they have COVID, are they so sick that they need to come into the hospital? Uh, can we send them home? If we do send them home, how will we be able to monitor them? Are we able to get oxygen for them? Some people can, can do okay if we just have oxygen and we can send them home with oxygen, but that can be very difficult to get. And then if they're really severely affected, the ICU may be the only place where we can take care of them. We also have to make sure that uh, the staff is safe. 
And so when I'm in the emergency department, I'm really um, always wearing a N95 and PPE. And actually I feel at times safer there than I am uh, sometimes uh, in, outside in the world because I'm completely uh, covered with PPE. And contact tracing is not always available. Unfortunately, we make the diagnosis and have to send people out. We hope that they'll be uh, getting contact tracing, but that's been a problem. Same thing with quarantine. We're not always able to help people uh, get quarantining because uh, a lot of them live in environments where they're uh, in a small house with nine or 10 other people and quarantining is very, very difficult. So that's a whole other issue that we can talk about. Next slide. And then education, how do we really educate our workforce? Again, we don't have good systems uh, to deal with a whole new disease like this. Our continuing education system was really not built to, to address a new disease appearing. And so we're now trying to, to deal with that. But I know a lot of times I learn the latest information when I actually get to the emergency department and people say, oh, this is how we're doing this now. Um, and we've made some changes as far as uh, new treatments. And I think, wow, that's great to know. But it's not really formal education the way I would get it if I were uh, in medical school or residency or even getting continuing medical education. Um, next slide. And then the treatment. And a lot of this has, uh, again, changed. And what I'm telling you today may not be true tomorrow, as I mentioned. Hydration continues to be important. Acetaminophen for uh, symptoms of achiness and fever. And then an the antivirals, uh, remdesivir, appears to be perhaps useful. Again, the information on that uh, appears to be changing and whether or not it will, will hold up, I don't know. Chloroquine um, was touted by the president and others as being potentially valuable, but really the evidence is not uh, confirming that so far. So I would say stay away from chloroquine. We've actually had uh, some deaths here in Arizona for people who uh, took chloroquine that they had for other reasons at home and overdosed. And chloroquine is a dangerous drug. It has cardiac arrhythmias that you can get from it. Don't take chloroquine, please. Uh, it's not going to uh, probably help you and it may hurt you. Um, oxygen is a mainstay of our treatment, uh, particularly uh, for people who come into the hospital, but may be useful if you can get it and you need to be uh, managed at home. It's not always easy to, to get that at home. Antibiotics can be useful if you get a super infection after the viral infection. Uh, again, that would probably require coming back, getting x-rays and demonstrating that in fact you have now a bacterial infection. Steroids is one of the really great new options available. So far the tests, uh, the, the studies are looking pretty good with steroids. So I think more and more we will probably be giving steroids to people with COVID. Uh, next slide. Convalescent serum. Uh, the evidence is not very uh, convincing yet. That was something that I think uh, there was some information from the FDA that would maybe jump the gun a little bit about convalescent serum. Uh, again, not evidence is probably not compelling yet to go that route. Proning is a new kind of treatment. Rather, most people, when they're in the hospital on a ventilator, they're on their back. What we're finding is putting people on their stomach uh, actually opens up uh, more ventilation in some people. Uh, so that's, that's useful. Um, also, less use of, of ventilators. It turns out sometimes ventilators can actually cause injury to the lungs if it's not really required. So I think we're trying to move away from ventilators if we possibly can, unless the person is really uh, extremely critically ill. Um, and anticoagulants uh, are being used because of some of the complications, blood clots and so on. Dialysis may be necessary if there's renal failure. And then vaccination, I'll talk about that here in, in just a second. Uh, next slide. So vaccination, of course, is the, the million dollar question. And there are a lot of people who are trying to make vaccines or even people now participating in trials that I know of. And will we have a vaccine? Most likely we will. Um, uh, what will it cost? We don't know. Who will have access? Most likely it will be people either in the health uh, care uh, provider group or people who are at highest risk. Will it be safe? That's, again, one of the million dollar questions. I think uh, there's, there's always been some fear of vaccines, even when it was pretty well proven to be safe, like measles vaccines. We know are very safe, but we have resistance even in our own state in, in measles vaccination. Well, 
we have had some issues in the past with influenza vaccines where um, there were some people who had complications from uh, the swine flu, flu vaccine with a Guillain-Barre, which is a paralyzing kind of condition that a very small number of people got, but it, it was something that was worrisome. So I think that there's going to be concern about the safety of the vaccine and convincing people to take it even uh, when we have it available. I, I think it will be ultimately available and it will probably take a longer time than a lot of people would like it to be before we prove that it's safe. Uh, next slide. So then uh, the benefits and costs of reopening, and this is something maybe Josh to talk about, clearly having the data to know where we're at at any one point in time and what are the potential uh, risks of reopening, whether it's uh, opening bars or restaurants or other areas that, that we like to use. Hopefully it will be based on science, based on the data that we collect, uh, that actually that Josh is involved with collecting that tell us how many people in our population actually are positive so that we can know what the chances are when we're doing our normal things out in the world that we're gonna actually get infected by somebody else. And that's where we develop our policy. Unfortunately, politics have gotten very mixed into the science and policy. And hopefully, again, that our, our time together today, we can answer some questions and help all of us try to make good decisions about these kinds of things like opening up schools and opening up other activities. And you know, then the big question is, well, the, the economy, uh, we don't want to hurt our economy. Well, then how much is a life really worth? And, uh, you know, we, I would say at least in the malpractice world, uh, you know, life probably is worth over a million dollars. So uh, how, how do you figure that into, um, into making decisions about uh, opening things up? I don't know. That's really a hard thing. So I'm going to, um, I think I have one more thing. Uh, next slide. And then modeling, and, and maybe Josh can talk about this, but I do hope that these decisions about opening up will partly be based upon the modeling we don't. And one, on this slide, you can also see the models in other countries um, are quite different from the US. The Korea model is very different from the US model. Why is that? And what can we do to um, get ourselves more like uh, the Korea model? Uh, and we can talk about that, but a lot of it has to do with decisions we make, like wearing masks and social distancing. And um, a lot of that is within our control, uh, but we have to make good decisions. So I'm going to stop there and uh, open this up to questions. Yeah, that was awesome, Dave. Thank you. Very informative. <clears throat> Lots to talk about uh, from both lectures. So I'm happy to, I guess there's some Q&A uh, questions uh, on the uh, on the little Zoom box here so I can read those and then uh, people can chime in as well. This is from uh, Michael uh, uh, Rebior. Apologize if I uh, butchered your last name there. But So where do the volunteers, this is for Josh, it seems like, where do the volunteers come from that we're handing out the saliva testing, Josh? Right, so we, we um, you know, that's a big deal for us because um, finding people to help us with collecting samples is always a challenge for our team. Initially, of course, we had this huge outpouring of people who were willing to volunteer to help with us. Uh, over time, you know, people got back to their lives and so it's, it's getting harder. We do, um, we are now paying people at, um, at some of our collection sites for the public testing to come and help uh, with that effort. And some of them have come from the School of Nursing. They've been outstanding. Uh, others have been just through, you know, uh, a local hiring groups that help hire either nurses or other volunteers. You don't need to be a nurse to help with uh, saliva testing because there's actually no clinical procedure that needs to happen there. So if anybody wants to volunteer, we're always, uh, uh, you know, Kay Robinson and, and uh, Kim Fields are always collecting names for that. Um, uh, but we, and then of course, when we go to local sites in other parts of the state, we work with partners that are local in the state and we ask them if they can help us find folks willing to um, man the site. So typically we need at least one healthcare personnel to oversee the operation, but the actual, you know, collecting specimens and stuff doesn't need to be anyone clinically trained. That's great. Uh, and this is from our very own Scott Leishow. For both of you, uh, since a, a vaccine uh, seems possible but not certain, uh, do you think continued improvements in managing symptoms 
to be sufficient to allow our society to sort of move forward to a quote unquote normal, normal period? I'll say something and I'm sure David will have things to say. So I would say, you know, um, we don't, we really want to stop the spread. We don't want to be operating at the level of managing symptoms. We really want to prevent people from getting this. What we don't know um, is whether or not even asymptomatic in individuals could suffer long-term consequences from this virus. We just simply don't know that. Uh, the virus has not been in the human population a full year yet. And, um, and so long-term studies are impossible. Uh, we do know that there are plenty of viruses out there that can cause cancer over time, that can cause neurological disease over time, that can cause all kinds of long-term health sequela from getting those viruses. And we just simply don't know in this case what this virus does. Um, so the best thing you can say is don't get it. That would be the best. And so what we need to manage it and what we need to do for keeping uh, society open is to continue the things we're doing right now, which is you know, wearing masks, by far that is the best thing we can do. Keeping spacing, not going out if you don't need to go out. Don't get into any kind of large gatherings of people. That's just a silly thing to do. And then, um, and get tested. Um, if, if, if you're somebody who stays home most of the time and doesn't really interact much with the public, probably don't need to get tested. But if you are out and about, or if you have a job that is public facing, if you are in retail, or if you are at a restaurant, or if you are doing something, you're a repair person or you're a help desk person or whatever it is, and you interact with a lot of people, you know, get tested. If you're part of ASU, of course, we have free testing all the time. Um, and we have it all over campus. And, you know, avail yourselves of that. I mean, you know, I, I've gotten tested a few times and I'm really not out and about very much. Um, it's pretty easy. Yeah, and as far as symptoms, I mean, I think we obviously have to still respond to people's needs. And if people are feeling bad and sick and um, and so on. I, finding better ways to uh, treat them uh, is always going to be important. I mean, that's really what the medical, the care delivery system is all about. Unfortunately, I think as Josh just said, really the answer here is going to be preventing this disease as opposed to just getting really great at treating it. Because if it continues to spread, um, that's not really the best answer. On the other hand, we are discovering new ways of uh, doing this better. And uh, as, so with experience, I think that we will be better at it, but uh, prevention is, is really number one. Yep, agreed. Uh, so a uh, question on the, um, on the chat from Beth Janda, uh, hospital-based results normally say that results cannot be confirmed without symptom knowledge. Uh, was that, oh, she had another question before. Why is there such a significant variance in test results? Regarding test results, I was referring not to just results, but to time of take to obtain the results. Time of what? Time to obtain the actual results. Yeah, so um, the, certainly over the summer, we saw a, a, a huge issue with a lot of test results uh, in, in this state and across the country. And it really does depend a little bit on who's doing it and, and how they're doing it. Um, uh, fortunately for us at ASU, our, our testing system has never had delays. We've been able to get results out very quickly. But it is true that um, SonoraQuest and others had a pretty big backlog. And part of that was because they had a big, they did carry a bigger burden in terms of overall testing. At, at that time, they were doing more than we were. Um, and um, they, they basically just did not have the systems in place to manage the volume that they were getting. Um, largely because they were getting a lot of the flow from the hospitals and from the clinics. And so that caused them to be delayed and they were sending out results 10 days, 14 days after samples. And that's just useless. I mean, uh, you need a result in 24, 48 hours to know while you're still potentially infectious that you need to be quarantined. And so everybody now is pushing and now uh, even most places are getting results out. And certainly in this state, I think within 24 to 48 hours. I, I'm hoping that's the case. I know for us it is. Um, a question from Libby Murphy. Could we also be encouraging the community to be proactive about their health by supporting our immune systems with nutritious foods, exercise, sunshine, and some supplements? David, maybe you want to take that one. Well, yeah, I think, um, and, and there's actually several researchers at uh, um, the college who are actually doing work looking at, at ways of boosting our immune system. Uh, but so far, we don't know. Just like a lot of, you know, 
mentioned the information overload and it's it's huge and some of it um, is well meaning but we don't have absolute answers so uh, the best way to boost our immune system is wear a mask you know stay away from people who uh, have the disease and uh, yeah treat yourself well um, you know get enough rest and hydration uh, you know we still have other problems in our own area I think we are the leading place as far as heat related deaths so you know there's many other issues that we have to keep an eye on here um, and uh, boosting our immune system is great if we can figure out the best way to do it. Yep. Uh, Natalie Landman uh, asks, how often should one get tested by PCR? Uh, and then sort of uh, somewhat related, are there any plans to develop for ASC to develop their own antigen test that folks could do at home? Right. So um, I'll start with the second question first. So I don't know of anyone at ASU that's working on an antigen test. That doesn't mean it's not happening. Um, there are antigen tests out there. Um, a key element for antigen testing is the supply chain for getting the kits to run the test. Um, ASU had invested um, a decent amount of money, frankly, in buying a bunch of devices to do antigen testing, only to discover that suddenly the federal government decided after the fact that they were going to buy up all the kits for that particular brand. And so now we can't actually get the cartridges we need to run the test. So we're having to switch to a new one. <clears throat> and that is a common story in the antigen testing world. And do keep in mind, antigen testing is um, not quite as accurate as the qPCR testing. qPCR testing, we have um, uh, uh, plenty of supplies at ASU for that. So we're covered for at least 100,000 tests at this point. So um, we're in good shape there. Um, it is, uh, in terms of how often to get tested by PCR, it, I believe it depends a lot on your risk. It, as I said earlier, if you are someone who, you know, mostly does work from home, you know, goes out occasionally to go shopping, but other than that is at home and not really seeing a lot of people, probably don't need to get tested very often. On the other hand, uh, to take the opposite perspective, if you work in, if you have someone or in your family who works in retail, they see new people every day. Um, uh, if you are somebody who has to visit homes because you're a repair person, or if you're, if you, if you're exposed to people that you don't know, uh, not your usual family members, and, and you're doing so on a regular basis, then I would be tested on a, I would be testing every, every couple of weeks, every month. I would get, you know, use the public sites and get tested. You know, it doesn't, it, it's, it's easy, most of these days, especially with the saliva testing, it's a pretty easy test. There's no risk to actually physical risk to taking the test, and the results could be helpful. Okay, thanks, Josh. Uh, for David, maybe you want to comment on this from an anonymous attendee. Uh, any thoughts and comments on the mental health impact and implications of COVID-19? Well, yeah, no, the mental health is, I think, is actually huge, uh, and for a variety in a variety of places. First of all, the uh, <clears throat> for healthcare providers there's a lot of anxiety of uh, potentially becoming infected or getting family members infected. For um, a lot of patients, uh, I think uh, what we're seeing is depression and anxiety, uh, sometimes just fear of, of what's gonna happen to them because if you do get uh, a positive test, you don't know if you're gonna be one of the 5% or one of the 80%. And so that's, that's a little bit scary, particularly if you're in one of the uh, higher risk groups. And, uh, and then the other thing I'll, I'll say is that, uh, and we see this with a lot of uh, clinical problems, mental health connected issues connected with a disease, whatever it is, is a, is a bad combination. And so we do see among our patients who have mental health issues to begin with, when they get sick with COVID, it becomes a much more complex problem to try to manage figuring out where you're gonna take care of these people. This is a real issue for the homeless who get COVID. How are we gonna be able to take care of them? And if they have a mental health problem, a drug problem, it really, it makes all of those other problems that much worse. Um, just to add to that, um, there is this um, syndrome that has been observed in some people. It's not a huge number yet called brain fog. Uh, these are people who, um, not necessarily who are hospitalized, um, but who've had COVID-19 um, get this syndrome where they just, their brain is foggy and uh, it's hard for them to concentrate. In some cases, it's been debilitating. So it's something that we have to kind of keep an eye on. It may be a result of, of multiple small strokes, 
Um, but in some cases, it may be more chemically based. It's not clear. Yeah. Great. Well, uh, that's all we have time for today. I wanted to please uh, help me thank our, our speakers. Um, they're really busy, as I said, and uh, for them to take time out uh, to provide the latest updates and things is uh, really appreciated. We hope you enjoyed this and took away some new knowledge and ideas encouraging you to follow CHS, College of Health Solutions, on social media. Um, note the social media channels on the screen. There they are on the slide. Um, so you can learn more about health-focused events and opportunities like this one at ASU. Uh, please save the date for our next Health Talks, uh, which is also free and also available for continuing education uh, credits. Uh, it is health information and misinformation, something we talked a little bit about today as well. In the time of COVID-19, what can we believe? That will be on Thursday, October 22nd, also from noon to one. You'll find all of our upcoming health talks um, each month that we have at asuhealthtalks.com. So that's where you'll find recording of today's talk if you wanna go back and review it again or share it with your colleagues, it's totally fine. If you're looking to get continuing education credit for our talks, you'll need to listen to the webinar live and complete the post-evaluation uh, survey. So that's all I have. Thanks again for joining us today. Thanks again to David and Josh. and hope everyone stays safe and have a great day.